Matt Gleeson from Ragged Press here, and I'm on the line with Sean Morgan from uh, Cedar to talk to him about the upcoming Australian tour, uh, the Poison the Parish World Tour, actually. Thanks again, Sean, for your time. Sean, Cedar's been going for 19 years without any real significant hiatus. Um, that's quite an achievement. I guess um, what I'm really interested in is what's changed over that time? Um, well, for 19 years, the first thing that's changed is our, our bodies have been beaten to, to death. <laughs> um, I don't know. I think I think we, we you know we're all older, we're all wiser. We we all appreciate what we have now a lot more than we used to have it when we were kids. You know what I mean? I think when we were 20, 21 years old, you sort of go out and you don't, you, you don't you never expect much. You don't expect it to last forever. In fact, you don't expect it to last very long at all. Yeah. Um, you never expect to still be around 19, 20 years later and still be playing music and still be touring and, and still have a, a, like a, a, a sizable following. Um, so for us, I mean, I think for the most part, we're just grateful that, that we, we keep obvious, well, that we, that we keep writing music that people want to listen to and we keep playing shows that people want to see. Um, and then that, you know, that, that's what, that's, that's been our chosen career for a very long time. And, and, uh, and we, we've had many friends and bands who've, who've chosen the same career, but have fallen by the wayside and, and now have very different lives to the ones that they imagined for themselves and the ones that we live. So I think on, on that front, we're all very grateful for that, and, you know, um, and because of that, we, I think we take, we take shows very, you know, it's, it, when I say we take them seriously, it's not that we get there and we have, you know, stiff upper lips and, and, and that we, we, uh, um, we have no sense of humor, but I mean, we do take the show seriously now. You know, there's, mm. there's a, there's a, there's a certain, it's almost an unspoken contract that we have with, with the audience. That when they come to the show, we want to entertain them and we want them to leave happy and we want them to come back next time. So, you know, I, I think there's just a lot of things, a lot more self-awareness and I think uh, just awareness of, of, of the dynamic between us and, and people and, and, you know, we're, we're very excited to come over there and play. So it's, it's been quite, quite some time. So I think we're just looking forward to that, to have a good time. You know? So it sounds like it's still fun though too. It's fun. It, it's definitely fun. I think, you know, we all get on really well now. I think better than we ever have in a long time. Um, you know, a bunch of us have quit drinking and partying, which does help because then it's, you don't, you don't, you don't spend your days in a, in one of those situations where you keep trying to chase the dragon and, and you, 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 you know, you need hair of the dog just to function. And, 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 and you know, these are things that you learn as, as, as you, as you go along. So it's a small thing, but it does then also keep everybody's tempers at bay and it does keep everybody in better, t in, in better moods for the day. So, I mean, there's little things like that that change that help. And, 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 and we've never got on, got on better than we do now, I think, as, as the band guys. And we've got, you know, we had Clint Lowry come out for about a year to play guitar and he was awesome. And now, um, for this one, we've got Corey Lowry, his brother's coming out, and he's normally a bassist, but apparently he can play guitar. But we, you know, I've yet to see that, so that should be fun as well. I mean, yeah. you know, it's, it's just, it's, I think that the key to, to, to having fun, really, though, at the end of the day, is to surround yourself with fun people and good people and positive people. And, and I mean, I, without, uh, at the risk of sounding like one of those self help type videos or self help books, you know, that's just, that's the, that's the key is that if you surround yourself with good people and happy people and, and just positive energy and positive vibes, it makes the whole thing a lot easier to do. Whereas if you have people that are negative, and we've, we've had plenty of band guys come and go, they were negative guys that would bring the whole vibe down the whole time. Mm. Um, they would they would find reasons to be mad about something. They would find reasons to be unhappy about something. We had one guy tell us that he's never going back to tour overseas because he hates it and he only, he'll only tour in America. So he eventually left the band. And, you know, it's just, it's just, it's just, it's just these, these, again, we were all, at the, I think at the time, there's, whether or not we want to admit it, we all have this sense of entitlement perhaps and that we don't, we don't even, we might not even recognize that it's there. Um, but the, when you get older and you look back and you say, okay, cool, these are things I can change to, to sort of survive this world and this life a little bit better. And that's what we do. And I, like I said, we're all getting on really well and the guys are, the guys, everyone's, everyone's right now we're at home for another couple of weeks before we, we start off on this tour. And it's going to be a doozy because we, uh, you know, we start in, in, in the UK, then we fly to Australia, then we go to New Zealand, then we go to South Africa, and then we go back to Europe to, to finish the run. Uh, and that's all within the space of eight weeks, and I think we're hitting up, phew, geez, I don't know, there's, there's a ton of countries. Yeah. So it, it, it's exciting, but it's, you know, at the same time, if we don't look after ourselves physically and mentally, that, that's the kind of thing that would cause a band to break up in the day. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? So, I think, Just the flight from the I UK think, to Australia is a killer. Yeah, I, 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 I mean, that would be the worst thing, right, is that we break up on the way over there. It's canceled, and that's the end of the career. You keep your 
your mind focused and you and you and you try to you know you try to get and stay positive and, and I think yep. for for this trip we've got some you know we, we're gonna we got we got a, a lot a lot of new stuff on the new album we'll be playing um, because we you know that's the stuff that we're focused on right now and the stuff mm. that we really enjoy playing we'll obviously play some of the old stuff as well but you know I don't know we, we, we haven't really even thought about setless stuff yet I think I think what we'll do is we'll just go with the flow and see what people want and yeah. and our whole goal is to try and have fun with people that come to the shows and make sure that they have a good time so you know that's yeah. where we're at right now. And you're touring off the back of the Poison, uh, the Parish album, which I think's your seventh uh, release. It was released a couple of years ago. A, a, a lot of the writing, and from what I've heard, it, it's a much heavier direction for Seether. Yeah, um, I, it wasn't intentional to begin with, but as, as time went by and as I was writing the demos, I, I ended up writing about um, probably 30 to 40 songs that were... That, that could be considered for, for contention for the album, and then in amongst those, it just I just started gravitating towards the stuff that had more of the the heavy sort of simple sort of you know, I don't know the, the riff oriented rock stuff, the stuff that mm. and that made me feel good, and the stuff that I that I really love to play, and the stuff that I can imagine the band playing uh, without being bored of it, or not being bored, but you know what I mean, just just, just having fun with it every single time. Yep, and so. I focus more on that stuff, and the more I focus on that stuff, that's the stuff that really started really grabbing my attention and held my attention, and, and, I, and I was getting really excited about that stuff. So then it started shifting towards that direction, and I mean, I'm happy with it. You know, I think I think we've 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 done the, we've done a couple albums where we dabbled in a slightly softer side, and, and perhaps maybe a, a more overthought um, musical direction where we where we sort of we try to be a little too clever and try maybe try to get ahead of ourselves a little bit here and there with music and uh, and. I think I think that's great. It has a time and a place, but I don't think that's where we're at, where we, where we belong. I think this album is the best representation of us as a band, and certainly me as a songwriter, um, in, a, in, in, in in our entire careers. And I think that mm. that that's something. I, yeah, I'm really proud of it, and I think that it's good. again, it, it's it's the album that if, if if this music, if our career was to end today, and somebody had never heard of our band, I would I would hope that that would be the album that, that people would reach for. Because for me, I think the strongs of, the songs are the strongest that, were, that I've written. And, yeah, and I, honestly, this one, I, I was so close to it, and I was I, I was so involved with every single part of the process, from writing to to uh, producing, um, that, and, you know, and artwork, and the whole deal. I mean, I, I, it really was, this is, this, is, this is very much my baby. So for me, I feel like this is the one I'm most proud of, because I really micromanaged it, and I think that, that the end result is something that I, I hope... Um, people understand what I was trying to achieve, and, and certainly, and, and and quite honestly, you know, at the end of the day, music's supposed to be fun and make you feel something, and, and, and this this album does both for me. So that's kind of that's kind of why I went in that direction. Yeah, and obviously, when you're that close to something, um, and and record companies like to have input too, was there any tensions there, or or, or you know, how did that affect the process? Yeah, no, I think quite the opposite. I think the record company was quite gracious. Like they they they. They asked for demos when the demos were done, and they got them when they were done, and they said, "Cool, it sounds like you guys are ready to make an album. Go ahead and do it." They mm. they never really did that that sort of horribly invasive um, A and R maneuver where they come in and they tell you how to write songs, even though they they wear a suit and sit behind a desk all day. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like they really they really are good people. They've been in the business a long time. I, I mean, I love all the guys at the new record company. The old record company was different. They were the people that would tell me I was. Yeah, I couldn't write songs. I was horrible at it. I needed to get an outside writer. Um, you know, I should rethink this career. Like a whole bunch of things that they were saying because, you know, that's the arrogance that these people have got. That, again, it's a guy that wears a suit and often doesn't even wear a suit because he's too hip for that now. Yeah. But it's, it, it's it, it, yeah, it, there's, there's, I think often it's too much of a, of, a, of a finger in the pie, so to speak, as far as the record company goes. You know, and that's, and that's always blown my mind is that somebody will sign a band and say, hey, we love the band. And as soon as you sign on that line, then suddenly they have all these ideas and directions for you to go in that are nothing to do with what they find. So why would they sign you in the first place? Mm. Um, like Wind Up Records, kind of, they, they were at a loss for a while because they didn't know which direction to go to make, to, they didn't know which gimmick to pursue. So, because they couldn't go with a Christian gimmick because Evanescence and Creed, that was sort of that, that route they'd taken there. So they went with the African, the South African, you know, and then that was a big thing. And, 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 and as, as proud as we are, of being South African, that's that's one thing. But the, it, it, it was like, why are you making our country of origin the main point here when you should be making the music the focal point? And, yeah. 
you know, I don't know. Again, in retrospect, uh, they just didn't really, honestly, there, there were a couple of people that were really bad eggs, didn't know what they were doing. And they got very, very involved in the first album, for example. The first one was horrible. We had to re-record some songs four or five times. Um, the album took about three months to do where it now an album takes us just over two weeks because that's what it should take. But yeah. it took three months because we, the, the, the A&R guy would leave. He'd come in on a Monday. Sorry, he'd come in on a Friday. Uh, after we'd been working from, from yeah, Monday through Friday. He'd come in on the Friday evening uh, before he went to an AA meeting to pick up Vulnerable Woman, which is, which is a true story, by the way. Um, we, we, he would come in and say, nah, I don't like to do it again. So between him and the producer, who were never around while we were produced, while we were recording, and this is our first album in the US, so, mm. so we don't, we, we're green, we don't know what to do, we, we don't know what to expect, we think that these people know everything and we have nothing, we have no right to say anything. So we, we endure this, and we suffer through this, and we had to do complete re-records from the ground up a few times. Um, and I just, yeah, I just lost all respect for them, but, and the fact was, this little guy, this little A&R guy, would just come in and throw his weight around, because, well, at five foot two, I think he was, I think he had a bit of a complex, and he'd come in and throw his weight around and tell us we were doing something wrong, and then he'd walk out again, we wouldn't see him for a week. Mm. Whereas the new the company, the A&R, I mean, they were great. Literally, they listened to the stuff, they said, hey, we love this stuff, so go ahead and record it. There was no, there was no, you know, maybe, they, <laughs> I don't even think I got a note on any of the songs from them. I mean, it was here and there. They said, well, you know, this is one, um, you, you, there was no, on their part, there was no micromanaging. It was just safe. You know, we love the band. We love what you do. Go ahead and make great albums. So in that, in that, in that aspect, in that regard, there's so much freedom. Um, that is great. And then you know, most of the people at the Red Company only heard the album when it was done, mixed, and, you know, done, recorded, and mixed. So yep. that's kind of a lot of faith that they have in us. And I, I must say, I really, I really appreciate that. Um, so, say the form in yeah. the late late '90s, I guess, on the tail end end of um, the emergence of grunge, which you know perhaps was one of the most exciting periods for music since the emergence of punk in the late '70s. Um, I think Kurt Cobain has been cited as a key influence, but I guess I'm interested about what influences have kind of occurred for you since. Um. Just anyone that writes good music is an influence to me. I, I've always been influenced by good music, melodic music, great lyrics. I mean, I, I've always been a huge Tool fan, for example, and I'm really mm. excited to hear what they come up with. Um, but it, yeah, I, I was definitely inspired by Nirvana to begin with, and Pearl Jam, uh, and then later on Soundgarden and Alice in Chains. Um, and yeah, you're right. That was an exciting time for music because there was a lot of diversity. And if you look at the four, I would say well, the four or five big bands of the early '90s, you got Soundgarden. Pearl Jam, Nirvana, Alice in Chains. You can throw in Smashing Pumpkins into that mix, I think. Mm. Um, and certainly those are the big five that I can think of off the top of my head. I'm sure there were others. And, uh, and uh, yeah, then you've got Rage Against the Machine, who was completely different as well. Mm. But you've got all these great bands that are out there doing this music, and nobody sounds like each other, but they all sort of have the same, give you the same feeling in a different way. So what you have nowadays, I find, is you have a lot of bands that all sound the same, and they all look the same. And they all kind of follow the same formula. I mean, I was watching, I was looking up, just last night actually, I was watching, I was on YouTube looking up some music videos, and I'm, I'm stunned by some of the bands that I consider to be absolute trash, and how many, like how many hundreds of millions of views they have on, mm. on YouTube, um, all because they have black eyeliner, and, 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 and they've, you know, they've flat ironed their hair, and they wear skimpy little health, you know, Little little schmedium T-shirts, and or, or they wear the, the the gothic ensemble, and they're all a bunch of poses, man. And these guys, mm. I know for a fact, don't play their instruments live because I've seen them play, and I've seen what goes on behind the scenes. I've seen the rigs that these bands carry around that help them sound like they know what they're doing, and I know for a fact that a lot of those bands mime live. So there's this. What blows my mind is that there's this apathy and this, this lack of concern for a band's musicianship and, and their actual skill. Because what, what people don't understand is the ability to make a band sound like they can play is very easy if you've got Pro Tools and you cut, you cut pieces up. And all a guy has to do is hit three or four notes, four, three or four notes in the right order, and then you can stop them and you can start them up again. And you know what I mean? You can, you can, mm-hmm. you can sort of con your way through it. And I think. Um, that's what's killing me about music these days. Is, and, 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 you know, to say rock is dead, of course it's going to die if everybody sounds the same. Mm. Or if everybody, you know, there's a, there's a blurishness to, to rock music now as well. There's, there's that, that sort of, that 80s excess came back in, in some aspects of it, which I, which I despise. That, that sort of, 
you know, the big hair. And, you know, here's my thing, and I've, I've said it before, and I'll say it again, and I'll say it, and I will say it again in future. If it takes you longer to do your hair than it takes you to write the song, then you shouldn't be playing music, mm-hmm. and it certainly you shouldn't get up there and pretend to play. I mean, I have the utmost respect for any band that gets up and plays their instruments, good or bad. But if you get up there and you have a, a, a Pro Tools rig that sits behind the stage and somebody hits play and you guys get up there and pretend to be playing, I find that deceitful and dishonest and just, just I mean, basically, at the end of the day, just reprehensible because it's not real. Mm-hmm. So you're up there basically, I mean, anyone can do that night after night. You can pretend that you're playing and you, and you can pretend that you're singing and you can pretend that, you know, there's a whole bunch of stuff you can pretend and you can go out there and you, and you, and you can sell that that facade and that, that snake oil to the, to the people. But I mean, I, I don't know. I think, I think that that's possibly why we're in, in, in this sort of a doldrum right now. But I feel like there are bands that are, that, are, that are going to come out. I mean, most recently I could think of, say, Highly Suspect and, and uh, Royal Blood, bands like that kind of, mm-hmm. that, that kind of, I don't know, that kind of sound. It's sort of got a bit of a retro sound, bit of a loose sound. It's not quite as polished, but the songs are great. So I feel like those kinds of bands um, are necessary right now more than ever because, I mean, if you put on some of the radio stations, certainly some of the rock stations that play all of the newest stuff, to me it just sounds either it's, it's, it's been watered down or dumbed down or it's it just sounds like anything else I've heard before. I mean, mm. they, 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 there have been days when I'm driving in my car and I've got the radio on and satellite radio and I'll hear, I don't know, four to five songs back to back and I can't distinguish between them. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and I, I'm not being facetious. I'm, 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 I'm being honest where I, where I go. I have to look down to, to the display to see if the song changed because mm-hmm. that to me is just how how sort of atonal it's all become because these guys work with the same producers and they work and those producers work with the same drum triggers so they all have the same drum sound. Then they use the same guitars through the same through the same amps through the same effects to, to, to make these because that's what producers do. They get lazy, you know. Mm-hmm. And then so that's easy. They they have everything all set up so when a band walks in, they know what they want the band to sound like because it's their signature sound supposedly as the producers like to call it and then that, 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 there's just no variation there's no variety there's no it's no wonder that pop music is so is, is at this point ever I mean, it's always been obviously bigger than rock music but certainly rock music used to at least put up a pretty good fight for it mm. but and I guess that varies from country to country too but pop music has got some pretty insightful lyrics now and some some really some really sort of you know in-depth looks at, at life and and just the, the world around us, which you know, it's, it's not the it's not the oops, I did it again crap of, of the early of the, what the early two thousands, late nineties. It's, it's now, I mean, there's this stuff there that, that you can think. You know, if you look, if you listen to some of these these uh, pop groups or these sort of folk groups, there's some really insightful, cool stuff. And, and I mean, I love that kind of music. But there's also a, a variety of styles and sounds, and not everybody sounds the same. Now, when you come to EDM, I can't tell the difference there either, because that to me just is. is yeah, lost cause as far as I'm concerned. But that's the problem. If there's no variety, there's no choice, then people will get sick of it and move on to something else. Because yeah. if you keep shoving the same thing down somebody's throat, they ultimately are going to start choking on it. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. We might just, because um, we've used up our time, I think, so I just might end on um, one last question. What's next for Cedar? Uh, well, we, we're going to tour for the rest of this year. Um, then we'll probably take a small break at the end of the year, and then we'll start up again pretty early next year, I'm sure. Um, and I'm, I'm, I think we're hoping to go probably into somewhere around the middle of next year um, before we pull the plug on the tour on the album, and then we go back into. And then, yeah, we'll take some time off, and I'll start writing for the next album. Yep. Um, so not much exciting stuff happening, but you know it's. It's kind of, that's the, the exciting stuff for us is once the tours are over and we get to write new music. So for me, so right now that's the plan is we're going to just be, going to be hitting the road quite hard. We're going to try and, we're going to try and hit as many countries as we can before the tour ends and, and really, really focus on some places we haven't been to in a while um, and, and try and, you know, put on a good show and, and sort of keep the fan base satiated and hopefully get, bring in some new people. And yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's basically, it's just, it's just what we do. We, we're, just, we're, we're a touring band and we always mm-hmm. have been. And so... That's where we, we've, we've felt the most comfortable for a long time. So, oh, so currently that's the plan is just to keep touring um, until either we say that we've had enough or they send us home. Yeah, fair enough. Hey, Sean, thank you very, very much for your time. And we look forward to seeing the uh, Poison the Parish World Tour hitting Australian shores in May. Awesome, man. Well, thank you for having me, brother. Uh, yeah, I hope to see you then.